Thanks for coming out today to hear this talk. I'm really excited about it. It's um, a longer time than I'm, I usually get to talk about shorebirds, and so we get to get into some of the things about them that make me love them so much. Um, so thanks for coming out for that. Thank you to Dory uh, for organizing this, certainly Goldenrod Foundation for even hosting this great winter series, and also um, to Manamet, as Dory explained, who I work for, um, have been for the last seven years. Uh, roughly, I think, seven years. And um, the first five of those, so let's say eight now. So the first five, I was based here in the town of Manomet at Manomet headquarters. And then about three years ago, my husband and I, Keith over there, um, we moved to southern Maine. So I'm able to still work for Manomet, but from home in southern Maine. Um, so that's the main car plates <laughs> you see out there in the parking lot. So um, I did want to talk about the whole life cycle protection of shorebirds and, um, and how it takes a network really to, to conserve them. And um, I'm going to start at least with uh, what are shorebirds? Because um, I'm not sure how familiar you all are with the different bird groups. So we'll just start with that and meeting the family. So this is who I'm going to be talking about. This is the family of birds I'll be talking about today. And you can see that they're all shapes and sizes, but they're pretty much brown. <laughs> so um, I was not, I mean, I was obviously a birder for a long time, but not particularly into shorebirds when I first started working for Manomet in their shorebird program. And thankfully that was not <laughs> a showstopper um, because of my willingness to learn. Um, but this is a lot of what they look like out there. Um, they all look very similar. Um, a lot of the similar colors and uh, movements, and it's one of the more challenging groups of birds, I think, to get to know and to tell apart. So I love this picture because <laughs> uh, this is taken at an education site down um, in South Carolina, and they just made it so much easier for all of us. Just line them up. I wish they would do that when they're on the beach. Um, it would make it so much easier, but this is a really neat example of the breadth of, of variety um, in shorebirds, although they still retain a fairly similar look. So all the way on the right, you see the leaf sandpipers and uh, western sandpipers uh, moving left. Um, sort of in the middle of the group, you have the red knot and the ruddy turnstone. Moving further to the left, um, there's that one that stands out, that American oyster catcher. <laughs> and then uh, marbled godwit, and that, that's about the size range. And you'll notice on these birds, going from right to left, the size of the bill really changes. So they, you've got very small bills, and all the way up to these very long, slender bills. And right there, that's going to dictate pretty much where they're gonna find their food, um, whether they're gonna just be pecking at the surface or just a little bit into the surface to find food or much longer bills, they can probe much farther down into the soil. So they're gonna be very specific to what habitats they need and what kind of food that they go after. Uh, similarly, their legs have different uh, lengths, so it's, it um, dictates the uh, depth of water that they can tolerate. Because uh, none of these birds float. Um, so they're, they're water birds, but they don't float, with the one exception of the phalarope. Uh, some of you birders would know the, the phalaropes, and they are the only shorebird that, that I know of that floats, at least in this hemisphere. So, um, so leg length is really important as far as what you can tolerate going in and out of different water bodies. Um, and as I mentioned, this is just a neat graphic of the kind of food that they can go after given their bill length and the different strategies that they can have. And if you look on the one um, second in from the right, uh, the godwit, that looks like a very stiff bill, but it is so flexible at the tip that it's actually able to open it up and move around and actually probe to find food. So it's, it's not this hard, rigid bill like I think most of us think of them as. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about their habitats. Uh, this is really important as far as their conservation goes. Up in the upper left corner, uh, there is a bird in there, it's a rock sandpiper taken in Alaska on the tundra. So blending into your environment is really important when you're, well, when you're any bird really, but particularly shorebirds. And moving down, we're very used to seeing them along the coastline and running in, in and out of the waves, and uh, that's a sanderling there. 
And then our American oyster catcher in the bottom left. Um, I kind of joked, I don't know where they would blend in. <laughs> Maybe a, an old subway station with that black and white tile, I don't know. But, um, but they're, they're sort of the clowns of the group. Um, and then in the right corner, uh, lower down, we have the buff-breasted sandpiper. That's part of a group of sandpipers, uh, we really call them grass pipers, because they'll migrate through the interior of the continent. And uh, they go into these grassy areas, low grass, um, edges of wetlands. So, you know, that's another consideration for conservation. They're not all at the coast. And then the upper right is just this beautiful aerial view of the Yukon Delta in Alaska, where a lot of these birds are going to breed. Um, and that's just really typical shorebird habitats that we work with. And so this slide is in Spanish, um, but uh, I just love the graphic in the middle. It just so sums up all the different strategies that these birds are using as they migrate, because shorebirds are migratory. And kind of crossing the continent, they might stay there, some might continue on, cross back over. I mean, they're fairly faithful to flyways, but we are finding some that are doing some fairly wonky routes. <laughs> it's really fascinating. And there's some that adopt a, a shorter migration uh, strategy. So they're doing small hops or maybe not going as far. But they are one of the most mobile and long distance migrants of animals on the planet. And, um, and they're doing this to be moving between their, nor normally their northern uh, breeding grounds. And then they're migrating basically over uh, however long it takes them for their species to get to warmer southering, or southering, <laughs> southern grounds um, to do their wintering. And um, so today as we're talking, we're going to be, we're gonna be moving throughout the continent, um, throughout the hemisphere with these birds. Uh, so where do we start? How about here? <laughs> in, uh, right in Massachusetts here, um, upper north is the Great Marsh. And further south on the Cape, we have the Monomoy National Wildlife Refuge. And I'll explain a couple of things that are in this slide later. If you focus your attention to that white circle in the middle, that's roughly the, the Plymouth Beach area and Duxbury Beach and that whole, that whole system. So that beach is so important for so many species. There's sanderlings, semi-palmated sandpipers, the piping plovers here, red knot, certainly, uh, ruddy turnstone. Those oyster catchers are here the wimbrel, but I, I'm sure you're not seeing too many of them here now. <laughs> so where do they go? You know, here we are, it's late February um, in New England. Where are these birds going? And that's been a question for scientists for decades. And I just wanted to share some of the amazing information that's been coming out of work that scientists at Manomet have been doing in partnership with scientists in Canada and all throughout the, the Latin America as well, to find out just where are these birds going. Um, so in the, the large picture there, that's a wimbrel, one of the larger of the shorebirds, that's capable of carrying a satellite tracker on its back. So we have uh, Brad Wynn at Manomet, he's part of the Shorebird Recovery Program. He's been involved with uh, wimbrel research for a long time, dating back from when he was in Georgia. And the lower left, that contraption is on the leg of a red knot, so it's tiny. I mean, it's like a paper clip, I think, as far as what it weighs. It's called a geolocator, and that's one of the newer of the technologies out there. And what a geolocator does is to measure the day length while it's on the bird. And then it also acts as a clock, and it can record the time of the sunset, and, the, and I'm sorry, the sun rising and the sun setting, and then day length. So provided you can capture the bird again <laughs> to, to get this geolocator off of it, you can run that data through and that combination of day length and time of sun, sunset and rise will, will put you in a specific place on the globe at any given time throughout the year. It's very specific to the, to the movements of the earth. Well, specific to about 100 kilometers, which is fairly, you know, we'll, we'll take that. <laughs> Um, and then to the right of that are the flags and the bands, and that's you know, really the, the where it all started with putting bands on legs of shorebirds and flags. And again, that just requires that you see them again. You don't actually have to capture them. But as far as the satellite trackers, the geolocators, um, you're going to want to try to get these birds in hand again. This is the stuff that amazes me. Um, so we're, we're looking at a semi-palmated sandpiper. 
And if you can see the pink line, that's its migration route over the course of a year. And there's a picture of him up in the right corner there. So very, you know, we're talking about, I don't know, what is the, maybe a bar of soap, a little bit more than a, the weight of a bar of soap, <laughs> I think, going this far. So this was a team from Manomet um, with Stephen Brown and Shiloh Schulte, Brad Wynn, and other partners um, in the U.S. government, Canada. It does take a partnership to pull this off. Well, we'll go to, back to 2013. Um, but in June, they, they went up there to Coates Island in Nunavut, northern, northern Canada. That's where the very top of that pink line starts. Attached a um, geolocator to a semi-palmated sandpiper. Now this, again, is a species that we can see here in Plymouth. And they went away, and in July, it moved further south down into James Bay. So this is in the late summer. It's already done its breeding. Hung out in James Bay for a little bit, and then um, towards the end of August, it took off to go south for the winter. Um, and it flew nonstop for six days. And you can follow that pink line going all the way across the Atlantic Ocean there. And where it, where it landed was in the, somewhere in the border between Venezuela and Guyana. So 3,300 3, miles later, six, out, six days later, nonstop, it lands there. <laughs> so, and I'll talk more about this, but as far as a conservation perspective goes, we want to make sure that there is the right habitat there for them and not a big uh, development or a parking lot or any of those things that do not jive with you know, landing and needing, needing resources. So that was at the end of August, September. It just made a casual trip of maybe 11 days. <laughs> Took its time to get over to northern Brazil. And that's where the line goes to the far right. And it stayed there for the winter. So Thanksgiving, Christmas, you know, spent it down in Brazil. And then come the following spring in May, early May, it feels the urge to go back up north again. This time it takes a much more scenic route. It stops in Cuba, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina. And so this may be in three weeks time, two, two and a half, three weeks time, it goes from Brazil up to um, Delaware Bay um, in New Jersey and Delaware. And that's where, that's a very important site for a lot of shorebirds um, who come through there and they just, by the time they get there, obviously they're pretty emaciated. So they need all the resources there to fatten up again and be able to continue on their journey. Um, so this one did it and by early June was back in James Bay and then by June 11th, you know, a week later or so, was back home on Coates Island and ready to do, do it all over again. Uh, so this just blew us away. <laughs> uh, similar with the Wimbrel, there's, there's several of them out there that are tagged with uh, satellite trackers. Uh, we're going to look at Pastel. He was, um, he was tagged in Altamaha River Delta in Georgia in April. And this goes back to 2012, but he's actually been doing this for about three and a half years. So he's really established quite a pattern. So in April, he gets, he's in Georgia. In May, he flies 2,000 miles nonstop up to Hudson Bay. So very far up north where those orange circles are. The color of those circles is just representative of how long it stayed in any one place. I didn't include the legend, but so it stays there, you know, in May uh, until August. August turns around, flies 2,000 miles nonstop south and goes to Cape Romaine Refuge in South Carolina. Hangs out there for a little bit, <laughs> uh, refuels, and then come September, flies 3,400 miles nonstop south to northern Brazil to winter and hangs out there for the winter. And the following April, turns around 3,400 miles later, arrives nonstop in Georgia back at the same salt marsh where they first found him and put the satellite tracker on him. So three and a half years, is the last data point for him came from um, like November of last year. So it's possible that the battery is given out at that point. Amazing, close to an 11,000 mile round trip per year um, to be doing this. And they've taught us a lot about site fidelity. Um, some birds are going back right to the same, you know, within feet of where they had their nest the previous year or where they've staged before. So the fidelity of these birds going to these places in the earth is just incredible. And that's another really key thing to know when we're talking about conserving them. 
and knowing where they're going and, and that it's consistent. Um, the last bird maybe you've heard of uh, B95 is um, a red knot that was, had a band and a flag put on him back in 1995. And, and they thought he was maybe about two years old at the time. So B95, he was, he's named that for the code on his leg, on the flag. And he was first banded in very southernmost um, Argentina at the, the reserve for Tierra del Fuego. And flies north, stops at uh, Delaware Bay in the spring, and fattens up there and then continues on way up to the northern part where that red line goes to Mingan Archipelago. So this is one of the species that has the most, one of the most um, longest uh, migration of, of shorebirds. So going from as far north Canada as you possibly can to having your toes in the, in the ocean pretty much on the other end. So that's round trip about 18,000 miles. This is a bird that we've been tracking since 1995 and he was last seen I believe uh, just this past winter. So he's like 22, 23 years old now. So he's the oldest known shorebird or red knot of the Rufa subspecies which is the one on, on our coast. So when you think about, okay, 18,000 miles a year times 20 some years, <laughs> um, they figure that he has clocked enough miles on his wings to have flown to the moon and halfway back. So hence the word moonbird, they call him the moonbird. And Phil Hose wrote a really fantastic book called Moonbird um, about him. So I um, encourage you to find that book because it's, it's really amazing to track not just his story, but all the scientists who work in all of the countries that we're talking about, um, where these birds are going, working together um, to collect data, to share stories. You know, whenever he's seen again, it's like, you know, it should be a day off for all <laughs> shorebird biologists and party. Um, and it, it, it brought about this great graphic um, from our Aves Playeras um, campaign. So Playeras de la Luna, are, is moonbird, playeras or, or shorebirds, luna is moon. And so this, I just love this graphic because <laughs> it's really what they're doing. Um, and the other one in this picture, B95 is in here, and then there's Yei, which is the letter Y-E-Y-I. -Y and uh, that's also for her band. So she's been at this since 1998. So she's probably the oldest known Rufa female um, so there's all kinds of theories, you know, soap opera theories about the two of them flying around the world together and meeting up in these exotic places. Um, so the two of them are, are pretty much making history on a seasonal basis. Migration, I mean, this, they're doing these amazing travels. Their body is, is adapted and made to be able to do that, which I just find fascinating. And again, I'm so happy to get into this a little more because their bodies really change to make this happen. And we've got feathers, feather molting, just like you know, most birds do. So they, they do the traditional moving from juvenile to adult feathers. And then every year they're going through a pattern of breeding and wintering plumage. So their, their plumage is changing throughout the year. And you can see that at the top, this is a red knot in full breeding plumage, that beautiful color that, that we see. And then as you move, you know, the middle photo is changing in, in that color. And then on the bottom is the winter. Right now, this is what our, our colorful red knots look like right now. They're pretty pale. And if, if I was on a beach in Argentina right now, I'd look pretty pale too. <laughs> so, so I kind of uh, can sympathize. Um, and then when you're looking at uh, just what their bodies are doing, their internal organs and their muscles. So they're, when they're migrating, they're all engine pretty much. Um, so their heart and their lung capacity is expanding accordingly. Their body weight doubles pretty much in fat. So, you know, it's the equivalent of a 200 pound person just eating and eating and eating and gaining 100 pounds and then taking off and going for a run nonstop for six days. <laughs> you know, it's incredible what their bodies can do. So, you know, you don't want any extra baggage. So you just, you're using that fat to fuel you. Um, so you don't need your reproductive organs at that point. Um, so they shrink. And your stomach shrinks because you're just working off that fat. You're not sitting and having big meals um, until you get where you're going and you need to refuel. 
So that, that's just a phenomenal aspect of shorebirds that I think put, really sets them apart from some other groups of birds. Um, and it's taxing to do that year after year. You know, 20 sometimes B95 has done that now. Um, so as if that's not hard enough, um, unfortunately we have to talk about the threats that they face. You know, doing these long distance migrations is challenging, but then there's also these threats that they face daily. We've got these massive storms and really chewing away at the beaches, not to mention the houses there. And on the other extreme, there's the droughts, you know, and they, that affects them just like people, because um, they're always looking for water. They finally get to a beach and they're trying to rest or refuel. Dogs that are off the leash come running and chasing them. And every time they have to get up and move from something, a predator, a person, a dog, they're burning off that energy that they otherwise need to go, you know, thousands of miles. Wise, you know, the photo with the people in it, you know, using the beach. And the timing is such that we all want to be at the beach at the same time. You know, the birds are using it at the times when we really enjoy being there. So a lot of the conservation that we do is trying to work with the local communities to find some happy medium. Oil spills that really um, wreak havoc on their habitats. There's modifications of habitat, wetlands, um, that then become drained for different uses, agriculture, other things. Imagine this is your view coming in and you've been flying for thousands of miles and you just want to land and fatten up and um, you got to pick your way through the, the hotels and all the tourists. That's a picture of Spartina control, Spartina being a invasive grass. And it's a real issue in, in certain places. Um, this particular picture is from Willapa Bay on the coast of Washington. So this invasive grass gets in there and we can really alter the habitat um, and hydrology and everything. So this is a, a photo of people trying to eradicate that. And um, um, so be, between the invasion and then just the efforts that it takes to try to get rid of it, um, it can really um, have an impact on shorebirds. So what to do? <laughs> if I could make it so there's, you know, uh, big lights coming out of the slide, I would. So the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network, and I'm being WISERN, is a coalition of sites um, and partners who recognize all of this about shorebirds and want to do something about it on the ground to make sure that when they get where they're going, there's adequate habitat for them. And because we're working at a hemisphere scale, we are encountering, I think there's five major languages um, within the hemisphere, so uh, we've worked with that and we have our logo and, and other materials available in Spanish and Portuguese and French. Um, Dutch is another one, but we're not there yet because <laughs> in Suriname um, is Dutch speaking. This network came about um, in 1985 because prior to that, shorebird scientists were noticing that the species um, populations are really declining, you know, since about the levels that they were in the 70s and earlier. Um, and it was really the vision of um, certainly Brian Harrington at Manomet and other his colleagues in, in Canada, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina over the years, and just being able to communicate and talking about what they're seeing and the declines in the numbers of birds that normally were coming to some of these key places. So as our previous um, director of the network, Charles Duncan, would often remind us that back in that time there, there were no cell phones, there were no email, um, there was really no internet to speak of. So, you know, these scientists are working together by just faxing letters back and forth. I think the fax was the big <laughs> breakthrough. Otherwise, you know, sending a letter to a scientist in Argentina or in Brazil or and just trying to compare data and get something going and you know wanting to know more about where our birds are going. So this network um, idea came about as a real vision um, of connecting the people at the places where we know shorebirds are going and conserving their populations and their habitats through this network of these key sites. Started in 1985, as I said, that's really when the concept was formalized. Starting last year, it became our three-year 30th anniversary. <laughs> We're going to stretch this out a bit because, woohoo, we had the concept, you know, so that's 30 years ago. But, okay, we need a site. So the first site um, that was designated as being part of this network came in 1986, and that was the Delaware Bay. And that was our first site, hemispheric importance. So. That was 1986, so we're really celebrating that this year. But you really can't have a network with just one site. 
So, okay, let's celebrate the next year again, which is 1987, when we got our second site in the network. And now, you know, we've got something. And that was the Bay of Fundy up in northeastern Canada, in Nova Scotia and um, New Brunswick area. Fast forward to today, um, we have 92 sites in this network, uh, spanning 14 countries. The most recent country to join uh, was Bolivia, and that was just um, a few months ago. Um, so these sites, you know, that you're seeing where all the orange dots are, that represents more than 13 million um, hectares, or 32 million acres of places that are really important to shorebirds, and there's people on the ground committed to conserving those areas. To become part of the network, it's a mixture of having shorebird numbers and um, a landowner commitment, and I'll get more into that. But it's a voluntary network. There's no laws, no, it's not regulatory. We, we have a hemispheric council um, that oversees the network and gives some strategic direction to it, approves sites that um, you know, nominate or nominated to be in the network. Um, but it's really a true partnership at a global scale. Uh, so I mentioned just the criteria to be in this network um, it really, first and foremost, is based on biological criteria. So what are the shorebird numbers that you're getting? Um, and there's three different levels of importance that your site could have. Hemispheric are sites that have more than 500,000 birds, or maybe 30% 30, 30 of a particular species. Or international is 100,000 birds total every year, or 10% of a particular um, species population, or regional. And that's a site that regularly sees 20,000 shorebirds, or 1% of a particular species. And really what sets Manomet and the whole Wissern program apart is this landowner commitment, the sense of stewardship. Because there's other bird programs or other conservation programs out there that look at sites on the ground as being important, and we draw a circle around it, or we w just work with data. Um, but in this case, we go the next step and actually talk to people on the ground and make sure that there's going to be a commitment that now we are aware that there's these amazing numbers of birds here, um, getting a commitment to, to do good things for those birds. And, and I, I say we, but oftentimes it's, it's very bottom up. There's sites that know about our criteria and come to us and want to nominate and become part of the network. Um, so all we ask, again, it's nothing legal, but we just ask that they agree in writing. If you're a landowner, or a manager of the area, um, that you make shorebird conservation a priority. It doesn't have to be number one, but just make it a priority within your management. And you, we want you to protect or manage your site in a way that benefits shorebirds. You know, a lot of sites have multiple uses, multiple priorities, but shorebirds need to be part of that. And just to update the network, if you have any changes at your site, be them ecological or, hey, we have a new refuge manager and and here's how to get in touch with her. <laughs> because it, we're a very small office. Um, there's uh, five of us, I think, for the, roughly, <laughs> for, for the Western, for the Western Executive Office. Um, so Dory mentioned, you know, myself as the conservation specialist. Our director currently is Rob Clay. He's um, based in Paraguay. And as I mentioned, I'm in Maine. And then we have another conservation specialist, Diego Luna. He's based in Santiago, Chile. Um, and then we have a woman, Laura Chamberlain, who's based in Delaware Bay, our first site. Um, so she lives down there. And thankfully, Lisa Shibley is our data um, guru, our information specialist. She's still based here at Manomet um, at headquarters. Um, so that's pretty much the team for this executive office. And of course, we work in partnership with other shorebird scientists at Manomet and um, certainly around the globe, but for this program, it, that's us. So yes, we like it when they come to us and tell us about their site, because it's a lot. So let's come back to Massachusetts, and we have two Wissern sites, the Great Marsh up north, and also the Monomoy National Wildlife Refuge is a designated uh, Wissern site. And within the Great Marsh, our primary partner there is with, again, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Parker River, National Wildlife Refuge, or Plum Island. So I'm sure some of you have been out there birding, and it's a fantastic spot. Same, as, same with Monomoy. But as we mentioned before, um, the kinds of birds that we're normally seeing here are, are elsewhere right now, for the most part. So um, it's end of February. We're in New England. So who wants to go south? <laughs> 
for just a little bit. I see a lot of hands. <laughs> Let the video know there's a lot of hands. Um, so let's go to where the birds are. And you'll remember from some of those um, slides I showed you of the tracking, they're in northern Brazil and Suriname and down in Argentina and Chile. Colors of those pushpins just indicate uh, the level of importance within our network. Red being the hemispheric sites that are getting 500,000 birds or more. Um, and then the gold colored ones are international. And I have that white one there up in the northern um, northeast coast of Brazil. That's Icapui and Banco de Cachoeis. And that has my Portuguese is terrible. <laughs> so I pronounce it with Spanish. Um, but that's a candidate site. So we also work with partners where we know there are important numbers of birds and work with them to become part of the network. And that's one that, that we're working with right now. So let's go all the way down to the bottom of South America and to Chile, down to Tierra del Fuego. And our site is Bahia Lomas there. This is one of, one of if not the most important wintering sites for the Rufa subspecies of red knots. So at a time, there was more than about half of the whole population is hanging out in, in southern Chile here. Um, and the partners there are really aware of this. And I could talk for a long time about just what they've done. But this is a photo here of the Bahia Lomas Center. It's a nature interpretation center. And it has the support of a lot of the NGOs there and the local governments. And it has taken years to get to this point. But they finally, they have this beautiful building and it's open to the public. There's you know, a lot of kids and teachers that come through, scientists, and they really celebrate the natural resources there. And one of our partners there, very prominent, and right from the beginning was the National Oil Company or Petroleum Company for Chile. Um, their acronym is ENAP. And they have a, um, co a corporate responsibility you know, program, and the director for that is, is his heart is really in this and has been from the beginning. And when we were first working with them, um, he just remarked at, you know, being, being the place where all of these birds are going to the point where they had a, um, like an oil platform that was very close to a very sensitive area for shorebirds, so they, they, they shut it down. We're not going to use that one. Okay. <laughs> and that's just been the tone. And they've been so generous with all of their resources, and they have been able to um, donate hours in their helicopter to shorebird scientists, because that's so expensive to try to get up in the air and do surveys. So they've been working with our scientists, ones from Canada, um, and allowing and being part of that process. And I just, I love this quote um, from the director of their corporate responsibility. He feels we have a responsibility to safeguard the quality of habitat for these shorebirds that fly more than 15,000 kilometers to be on our soil. So maybe it's a cultural thing, but they have just such the sense of hospitality for these birds being there. And the same is true in Argentina. Um, again, very close to the bottom of the, the continent there at the Atlantic Coast Reserve. And there, the mayor of the city of Rio Grande had a similar reaction in, in finding out just all of these birds that are coming there. There's Hudsonian godwits are also, you know, 42% of the global population is hanging out there for the winter. They also have a significant amount of red knots. And in learning about this and finding out, he just felt that, you know, these birds are flying how far to spend the winter in my town? <laughs> like, we need to make sure they're feeling welcome and, you know, I think if he could tuck them in at night, he would. Like he just has this really wonderful sense of hospitality and stewardship towards them that um, you, know, you wish could fill the hearts of every decision maker <laughs> and um, a politician out there. Um, so here in, in, in this reserve, he has been just a wonderful partner you know, at the local government level. But of course, there's a team of um, NGOs and other universities that are part of this. And they have a um, visitor center as well, education center for kids. A long, it took a long time to get there, but they did it. And in that picture is Patricia Gonzalez from Argentina. She's an amazing shorebird scientist. And um, she was able to present the mayor with a certificate for the 20th anniversary of this site being in the Whistler network. So it's been a site for a long time, but it just depends on kind of who's who is in power at the time and their conservation ethic, and, and we're really lucky to have him. 
And again, in the similar areas, the Rio Cachegos estuary, further north, the Bahia de San Antonio, is another site where just incredibly important for red knots, um, sandpipers, Hudsonian godwits, they're spending the winter there. And having these nature centers have opened over the last several years has really, really engaged the community. And that's a lot about what WISERN does, is trying to really work with the community to understand what's there and have a place to go to really celebrate uh, what they have. And it's a real sense of pride. And RARE, which is its own conservation group, they are known for having these pride campaigns. So we were able to work with our three sites in Argentina, the ones I just mentioned, to get funding years ago to do one of these pride campaigns at all three sites, having it be coordinated and using the red knot as their uh, focal species, you know, the flag bearer. So there's the bottom left is the red knot that they have is suited up on the beach dancing with everybody. Um, and that's just, that's just been a great story. And all the shorebird festivals that they're having. So, you know, right now we're, as we get into March, a lot of these sites I'm talking about are gearing up to have, uh, you know, an annual shorebird festival. And these um, education centers are really going to be the focal point where people come. And uh, so the, the birds are being well celebrated there. I mean, it's, all not, it's not all roses, of course. There's certainly um, challenges there. But we've been just really lucky with the kind of partners that are in these places. And Brazil is another one. Uh, a lot of birds are there right now. And we have a site in the north and in the south and then that candidate site I mentioned. So actually my boss, Rob and uh, Brad Wynn from Manomet and some other colleagues, they're in Brazil right now at this site in Nikapui. <laughs> and they're hosting meetings to talk about, you know, coordinated efforts um, between the US and Canada and Latin America for birds that are migrating. And Brazil recently um, finalized their national shorebird plan that didn't exist before. And there were representatives from our Western sites there during that process, and Manomet was part of helping that process. Um, so, you know, they're all there right now to just keep keep at it, keep continuing that. And I said, no, I don't want to go. I have a I have a <laughs> I have a speaking engagement in Plymouth, and I <laughs> I want to talk about that. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I'm kidding. We'll go out to dinner, okay? Okay, well, the Brazilian restaurant, yeah. Uh, but one place I did get to go, which was really amazing, was Suriname in northern South America. And we have three sites there, Copaname, uh, Biggie, Pan, and Wea Wea. And uh, that's where they're predominantly Dutch speaking. Uh, I do not speak Dutch. I don't speak Portuguese, which is why in the picture above it, there's another one of our partners who's based in, in Brazil, uh, Juliana, who was able to coordinate the meeting that she was doing a site assessment for that site and just understanding what the health is of, of the site and what the threats are. So that's, that's another thing that I do um, as a conservation specialist is to work with sites and do assessments of the whole area, you know, kind of a snapshot. Where are we? What's the condition of the site for shorebirds? Um, not just ecologically, but, you know, politically. And, you know, what are the social conditions here? What are the threats? What are some of the actions needed? So Juliana was able to do that kind of an, kind of an assessment for us in Portuguese. Um, so we're, we really would be nowhere if not for partners like that. Um, I don't speak Dutch, but I went to Suriname, and uh, luckily there's bilingual folks there, and did this assessment for them as well. And, um, you know, their hunting is, a, is still an issue. Law enforcement is a really, really big issue there. Um, and, and you find that here, too, where you have these amazing areas, um, vast areas, and maybe just a handful of people to enforce you know, the laws against cutting down trees or taking birds or, you know, you name it. Um, so I talked with some, some of the wardens there, the game wardens, the protectors of the park, and we were talking about things that they need to improve conservation. And um, one thing was a boat. I was like, okay, I just wrote down boat. And they said, well, a boat complete. Like, okay, <laughs> can someone <laughs> translate? With a motor. <laughs> So, okay, so, I mean, that's like opens up a whole new world of need. Um, and, you know, having the moped, but when you hear that there's some illegal activity going on in some far reaches of the park, we don't have any gasoline in, for our moped right now. So we can't go and pursue that. So, you know, that's just, they have to really pick and choose what they can go after. So, you know, as far as resources um, go, it's very tight. So when you look at some of the things that have been able to 
happen and materialize on the ground. It's usually with very few people, incredibly dedicated, and working on a shoestring budget. Um, so we really applaud all of our partners. And, and but, you know, I could say that really about any site, because I have yet to find a site that feels, we're good, we have enough people, we have enough money, we're good. So, you know, this full life cycle conservation is, you know, is sort of the heart of this talk. And I've mentioned a few things already that Wissern and part of this network are doing, and, you know, the site assessment tool and the workshops, that really gives a good amount of information to people at sites, but I'll also use them to look at the network and, um, you know, what are some of the trends that we're seeing? Are there regional um, issues? Or maybe this site has something in common with another site um, over a you know, particular threat. They would never talk to each other if not for some, some body that is sort of, you know, maybe 30,000 feet up and being able to coordinate. So it, it's, um, it's been a really unique role for our executive office to be able to do these kinds of things and on the ground, but also connecting at that larger network level. And Good Governance is a, a workshop that my colleague Diego in Chile does, um, really looking at bringing all the players together from media to local decision makers to the managers on the ground and looking at the processes by which they govern at a site and making it as transparent as possible and knowing you know, that the left hand knows what the right hand is doing and actually coordinating on this management. It's called a Good Governance Workshop. Um, and there's larger flyway-wide initiatives going on, and I mentioned that certain colleagues are in, uh, in Brazil now working um, underneath the Atlantic Flyway Shorebird Initiative. And that's just as many partners as I could probably name in five minutes. <laughs> and a huge coalition of people that are working together to think about birds and, and conservation at that flyway scale. There's a similar one going on in the Pacific Coast. And there's one particularly for Arctic migratory birds and, and their, their needs. Um, and I mentioned Stephen Brown. Uh, he's the director of our shorebird recovery program. And for years, he has done amazing work with partners again to have the Arctic shorebird demographic network. And you know, I've been talking about flyways, but they're looking across the whole Arctic and all of the breeding grounds and for all the different species and trying to figure out, are there limiting factors? Are there things that are affecting birds on the breeding grounds that have something to do with the declining populations we're seeing elsewhere? Because you know, if, if there's not a good survival rate of the young, you know, that has a domino effect. And you know, we have the recovery plans um, as well for, each, for a lot of these different species, or business conservation plans as, as we've been moving into to really you know, think about you put this much funding into a project and we want to see a certain return on it. And that is in terms of the numbers of birds. And the American Oyster Catcher, um, that's a presentation unto itself by my colleague uh, Shiloh Schulte, who's our recovery coordinator for that species. Um, you know, he was tasked with increasing the number of, uh, increasing the population, um, you know, 30 percent over 10 years, and we're at 10% higher. So it's, those measures are working, but it takes a lot, a lot of investment. Um, and we have this, like I said, the species conservation plans for 21 of the species now. And that just talks about everything that we know about that species to date, where it's going, what its needs are. And here's the, um, the action items, maybe for the next 10 years or so, we try to keep it somewhat manageable. Here's the things that really need to happen in the next so many years to make a difference for this bird, given what it's going through. Uh, so all that to say that throughout this whole network, um, we just have a lot of people on the ground who are just dedicated to uh, working together at these sites and at a flyway scale to try to, try to protect these birds at every point in their life cycle, because they're always on the move. <laughs> And I'll just end with um, this little gem. Uh, this was from our, one of our newer sites in Argentina, Laguna de Pozuelos, a higher Andean site. And these wings are uh, part of a, an outreach program from our partners in Chile that has now spread into Argentina and is even with us here in Plymouth. So we have that banner with the wings on it. We'll have it in the back. And part of this campaign, we are all shorebirds, or todos somos aves playeras, 
is to just say that, you know, we're all part of the flock and what happens with shorebirds affects our lives too in some way, either just aesthetically, spiritually, economically, you name it. Um, we're all connected. And so there's a real um, movement out there to join the flock. And so people have been taking their pictures in front of these wings for, for a while now, and there's a whole collection of them. But I just, she just sort of <laughs> really um, hit my heart. So I uh, wanted to end with her. And like I mentioned, we have the wings here. And if you'd like to have your picture taken in front of the wings, we can do that. And then to take home with you, or to give to friends, um, I made little versions of it. <laughs> so here's the wings, and um, I'll put it here so the video can see it. And all you need to do, we've got them right up here, just put a piece of tape across to keep it in place, and then you can put a little smiley face on the tape if you don't want to put it on your actual skin. And, and we can take your picture that way too. And just take this home and know that you're part of the flock. And these birds will be here soon in a couple of months. So I think we'll start seeing them again here. And you can, um, if you find one, try to sit down next to it and ask it all about Argentina and Chile <laughs> and Brazil. And, you know, they've got some stories to tell. Um, so with that, thank you again, Dory, for the chance to be here and for you all for coming out for this and just thanking all my colleagues and um, Goldenrod Foundation, the partners who make all of this possible, and then um, just some of our, our ardent supporters, um, which includes donors as well, and all of our members at Manimet. So thank you. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs>